are about to land in London's Heathrow Airport. The local time is 11.30 a.m. We hope you'll have a pleasant stay in London. You too, darling. Right, so that seems to be in order. Thank you very much. You can go Thank through. you. Good evening, madam. Uh, Your passport, please. Yes, thank you. How long do you propose to stay in the country? About 10 days. About 10 days, I see. Miss Dolly Parton. That's right. And uh, what is the reason for your visit? I'm a performer. You're a performer. And what do you do? I sing. same reason they like it back in, in the United States. I think country music tells real stories about real people, very ordinary stories, and I'd like to think, in my case, told in an extraordinary way. <laughs> but I think it's because it's real. I think they like it because it just talks about everyday living. Dolly, I read uh, once in Playboy magazine, the big interview you did, that you didn't, in fact, consider yourself as a sex symbol. Uh, were you lying to them? No, I really don't. See, I just dress the way I do because... Like I said, I was impressed with, uh, you know, people back home. I liked, I feel sexy. I mean, I like being a woman. If I had, if I'd have been a man, I'd have probably been a drag queen. Uh, <laughs> uh, how was working with Burt Reynolds in your last film compared to working with uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda? Well, there was quite a bit of difference. I enjoyed working with all of them, but I, uh, <laughs> but I don't dream about uh, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin at night. <laughs> I'd like to have your opinion on prostitution. Oh, I closed the whorehouse down, so I'm not really... <laughs> I'm not uh, one to judge or criticize, but I find that it's, um, you know, something that I shouldn't really dwell on. I, we, I love everybody. I hope everybody does well. And like I say, who am I to judge? I've got enough problems of my own. Are you a prostitute? <laughs> I just hope you won't forget that the fans like you more as a singer, not as a sex symbol. I'll try very hard not to be a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> and I will try to sing my heart out for the fans as I always have. <laughs>
minute and really say a very, very special hello to all of you and to say hello, I'm Dolly Parton and it is so nice to be with you tonight. <laughs> ah. I wanted to do a television show and I wanted to do it in London because it is a beautiful city and we do have better fans here than almost anywhere in the world and we proved that tonight, right? They're the nicest people I guess I've ever known. But anyway, we want all of you to join in and have a big time. Anytime you feel like singing along with us, clapping your hands or stomping your feet, it is your show. You paid a lot of money to come here tonight. And I want you to know that I appreciate it because I do need the money. It takes all I make to keep up my appearance. You'd be amazed at the price of industrial bras these days. And just how much money it can really take to make a person look so cheap. So anyway, <laughs> we want you to have a lot of fun tonight, which is exactly what we intend to do. And I want to go back now and do a song for you that was a big record over here many years ago. This is a story about an old redheaded girl that was trying to steal my husband back in the late 60s. Now, you know women do that sort of thing, right? Well, I want you to know she didn't get him. I fought that red-headed woman like a wildcat. She jerked my wig off and almost beat me to death with it. She beat the tar out of me, but I kept my husband. I got that supper home, and I beat the tar out of him. Her name was Jolene. Jolene, Jolene, 
together And I think I'll mosey down the hall And have a look around Cause I can't stay inside this lonely room And cry forever I think I'd really rather go Two doors down I would I was two doors down They're laughing and thinking And having a party But two doors down stalling <laughs> so I can catch my breath so I can get on to the next song without screwing it up <laughs> you'd think as big as my lungs were I could hold more air wouldn't you <laughs> I want to uh, calm things down just a little bit now and do a song for you that means a great deal to me before I go into the song I'd like to tell you a little bit about me for those of you that don't know I grew up in the United States, in the Great Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. I grew up in a family of 12 children. There's six girls and six boys in their family. My mama had one on her and one in her at all times. <laughs> I don't mean that with no disrespect because my folks loved one another. You'd think they would with 12 kids, wouldn't you? But we didn't have anything that money could buy. We did grow our own food. We knew how to preserve it. We had a great love for one another, a great faith in God, and it was that kind of a thing that got us through life. And I'm sure a lot of you folks can relate to this particular song about a little ragged coat I used to wear to school. <laughs> I was sure that most of you folks could relate to hard times, and I figure if you can't, well, I ain't got nothing else to say to you rich snobs anyhow. <laughs> Anyway, this is a song that I hope you'll enjoy. I call it The Coat of Many Colors. Back through the years I go wondering once again Back to the seasons of my youth And I recall that someone gave us And how my mama put the rags to use There were rags of many colors But every piece was small I didn't have a coat And it was way down in the fall Mama sewed the rags together So in every piece with love She made my coat of many colors that I was so proud of. While Mama sewed, she told a story from the 
Bible she had read about a coat of many colors, doors of war, and then she said, I hope this coat will bring you good luck and happiness, and I just couldn't wait to wear it, and Mama blessed it with the kiss. My coat of many colors that my mama made for me, made only from red. on my bridges, holes in both my shoes, in my coat of many colors, well I hurried off to school, just to find the others laughing, and making fun of me, and my coat of many colors, mama made for me, and oh I couldn't understand that, cause I felt I was rich, and then I told them of the love my mama sewed in every stitch. <laughs> I even told him all that story. Mama told me while she sewed and why my coat of many colors was worth more than all of their clothes. They didn't understand it and I tried to make them see. One is only poor, only a baby. for everybody to think that their kids are the prettiest and that their mom and daddy is the goodest and that the place they're from is the only place in the world to be from, right? Well, that's how we should feel. Everybody should be proud of their home place and their folks, if they can be. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that I had the kind of parents that I did and grew up in the Smoky Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. And I have written a song that touches me very deep. And I'm sure that in your own way that you certainly will relate to this. Because as our family started to grow, we didn't have any money, as I mentioned earlier, and people started telling us that we should kind of go up north, go to Detroit, work in the Ford plant, work in the car factories, give the kids a better chance to go to better schools and let them get out in the world, get out in the city, don't let them be backwoods and all this and that. And some of my people tried that, but as most of you know, that when country people try to move out into the big city when you're way in the backwoods, it's very uneasy at times, and my folks didn't adjust too well to that. A lot of them didn't. Some of them did stay and did raise their children there. Some of them did come back, and it always moved me a great deal of uh, how hard it was when you try to move out, be uprooted. And I think the one thing that saved us was the fact that we did have a great faith in God and we believed in Jesus. And this song, like I say, is very important to me, and I hope you like it. And if you don't like it, well, if you don't mind, I would rather not hear about it later, okay? <laughs> it's a song that I call Appalachian Memories. You ought to go north, somebody told us. Cause the air is filled with gold dust And fortune falls like snowflakes in your hands Now I don't recall who said it But we'd live so long on credit So we just headed out to find our promised land Just poor Appalachia Farm folk with nothing more than high hopes. So we hitched our station wagon to a star. But our dreams all fell in on us, cause there was no land of promise. And it's a struggle keeping sight of who you are. 
not far from us in this little old shack he lived by himself he had this long hair and this long beard and he didn't take many baths so he didn't smell real good mama didn't like me to go up there she had this dreadful fear he was a dirty old man but now you folks that know me know that i would have to find that out for myself so on certain days when the wind was blowing a certain way I'd hear him playing the banjo, and I figured anybody that loved music couldn't be all bad. And, but anyway, this is a story of my old friend Applejack, who I'm sure is playing banjo in God's Angel Band. And we're going to dedicate this to him tonight. So you have a big time with this. It always makes me feel good when I sing. He lived by the apple orchard in this little old orchard shack. His name was Jackson Taylor, but I called him Applejack. The old Applejack was loved by everyone he ever knew. Of course Applejack picked apples, but he picked the banjo too. Play a song for me, Applejack, Applejack. Play a song for me and I'll sing. Play a song for me, Applejack, Applejack. Play a song that your banjo will I'd go down to Applejack's just almost every day. Jack, old Applejack had me. Then he'd take his banjo down and then he'd ask me if I'd sing. And he would play the banjo and I'd play my tambourine. Play a song for me, Applejack, Applejack. Play a song for me and I'll sing. Play a song for me, Applejack, Applejack.
Michael Jacka, be proud of us, Whitney. I bet he's looking at us now thinking, look at them people from London. Ain't they sweet? <laughs> Didn't they do us proud? I used to sing an awful lot with my folks because all of my people are very, very musical. And I used to especially think I sounded good with my brothers. So I'm going to ask some of the boys to come down tonight from the band and help me sing a little bit on this one. <laughs> anyway, this is Richard. This is Jim. And dragging around in the back is with his cord caught is Greg. <laughs> Ain't they pretty? You boys ready? This is called Do I Ever Cross Your Mind? Mm -hmm. But we're going to do this with no music tonight, just us, if that's okay with the band. You hold off and we might let you play later, okay? All right. I know it's going to be hard to contain yourself, but just wait just a minute. Okay. Oh, sometimes I go walking through fields where we walked long ago in the sweet used to be. And the flowers still grow, but they don't smell as sweet as they did when you picked them for me. And when I think of you and the love we once knew, how I wish we could go back in time. And do you ever think back on old memories like that? Or do I ever cross your mind? Yeah. Oh, how often I wish that again I could kiss your sweet lips like I did long ago. And how often I long for those two loving arms That once held me so gentle and close And when I think of you and the love we once knew How I wish we could go back in time And do you ever think back on old memories like that or do I ever cross your mind? When old memories appear, my eyes won't stay clear. When I think of those happier times, and do you ever recall these old memories at all? Or do I ever cross your mind? Or do I?
just a second. Now we're back in. Oh, well, that was fun. You do good. You do. Let's pretend like that we have that song out since you seem to like that best so far. And you know I'm not one to let something rest. I will wear it to the ground. <laughs> So let's pretend like that we have this out on a little old 45 speed record and play like we put it on the record player, or plaque. Like we put it on the record player and we flip it up on 78 speed. Now I know everybody in this house has fiddled around with your record player. Flipped one of mine down on 33 and made me sound like Porter Wagner. <laughs> no. Well, here's how we sound on 78. You boys wound up your been since we got here? Okay, you sure you wanna try this? I'm gonna embarrass you real bad. You're not gonna look good with the folks back home, but that's okay. Blame it on me, all right? <laughs> well, sometimes I go walk in the fields where the walk won't go and the sweet used to be, and the flowers to grow, but they don't smell as sweet as the evening you think of me. But I think of me, but I was a few. Oh, I was, oh, I was, oh, I was. Oh, I was. Thank you. Thank you. Get back to your oh, Ain't it amazing what some people will do for attention? As if I hadn't done enough. <laughs> Speaking of attention. When we came over here to work on the show, I really wanted to go around the city because I never really had to, got to do really a lot of sightseeing. And I wanted to see Buckingham Palace. I wanted to see Piccadilly Circus and all the glorious things that there are to see around London. And uh, so I was riding around in the limousine and we went by the palace and I was doing my queen's wave, waving at everybody and saying hi and hi, how you doing? And then we did go down to Piccadilly Circus and I noticed that we got a lot of punk rockers here tonight, which I'm very happy to see. I think they call them romantics now or something. But anyway, around the, uh, <laughs> sitting around this fountain, I was just having the time of my life and I was waving and someone was going, someone was just looking at me, someone was going, hey, there's Dolly Parton. And this one with the purple and green and blue hair went like this. And I thought, well, I don't think my fans back home and I don't think my fans here in London would want that to happen to me. So I went like that back. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, I don't take no punk off nobody. <laughs> I was the original punk rocker. Back when I started uh, bleaching my hair, I was about 15 years old, brought up in a very religious family. And, uh, when I went home with my hair all bleached and teased all up like everybody's doing now, my old aunt had died and left me a pair of pierced earrings. And so I took a ballpoint pen and I took a needle and I pierced my ears and I had feathers and all kinds of stuff hanging out. And, and I had my hair all up and my mama said, Oh, Lord, where did I fail? The Lord must be putting me through some kind of test. I guess I must look about like you there. <laughs> she said, It must have been Satan himself make you wear your hair like that. I said, Now, Mama... Let's give credit where credit's due. I thought this up myself. But anyway, <laughs> I was a little bit of a troublemaker, but I was a good kid. I just uh, wanted to look a little different because I felt a little different. But my granddad is a preacher, and some of the greatest memories of my childhood was going to church, in all honesty, and singing the gospel songs. When they used to have the tent revivals, it was too hot in our little old church to have church in the summertime because we didn't have air conditioners. So we used to go outside. People used to come and run revivals. And I may not be much, but I do know there's something greater than all of us. I have to believe that or else I'd lose what little mind I have. But I prefer to believe it because I do believe it. Ooh, hot August night with the leaves hanging down and the grass on the ground smelling sweet.
the night gets suddenly still and when you'd almost bet you could hear yourself sweat well he walks in eyes black as coal and when he lifts his face every ear in the place is on my breath just a second and run off and get a glass of water, put on a different dress. And uh, <laughs> you've never seen that dress. Anyway, but mostly what I want to do is to feature the band on stage because like I say, I would be very much like Miss Piggy if I wanted to hog the whole show, which I am anyway. But <laughs> I want to uh, ask Tom Rutledge and Jim Selstrom to come down and play a couple of our favorite songs back in the United States. I'm sure certainly yours. Dueling Banjos and Orange Blossom Special. So would you make them feel real welcome? As soon as you're ready. How about a big hand for Tom, Jim, and all the band. I'll be right back.
people always wanted to. When I was a teenager, when Elvis Presley first came on the scene, you know how everybody just was freaking out over Elvis. He was the sexiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Of course, we didn't have a television when Elvis came out, but there was an old lady who lived down the road a good ways from us. And uh, me and a bunch of my sisters, some of my girlfriends, sneaked off from home when he was going to get in trouble because they didn't want us to see all this sexy stuff and they didn't want to slip and all from home. And, but I remember, I don't know when you folks first saw Elvis on television, but there was a show called The Ed Sullivan Show back home. And he was the first one that had the Beatles on, and he had all the famous groups that would, you know, come out. And he kind of really set a lot of trends in television there. But on this particular occasion, when Elvis was just the hottest thing going, they wouldn't let him show him from the waist down because all the, you know, the Elvis, the pelvis stuff, you know. So they shot him from the waist up. But they thought that kept us from seeing it in our minds, not us girls. I saw that night after night after night. I knew exactly what he was doing. But anyway, so after uh, I saw him once, all those homely, hairy-legged boys back home just never held that much fascination to me after that. So, <laughs> so I went back home, and I'd get up on the hill above the barnyard, and I'd pretend like I was Elvis. I'd thought about Elvis had he been a woman. Especially one like me. If I'd have been on television, they'd have shot me from the neck up back then, right? <laughs> well, anyhow, this is sort of how I used to entertain them chickens and hogs and stuff. And this is sort of how I looked. God knows I ain't no Elvis. There never will be another one. But I just thought this might be fun. And he might be watching us. He might get a kick out of it. So this is how I pictured Elvis back then if he'd have been a girl. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Don't jive me now. I've got a little number I'd like to do for you tonight, but before I do, I want to make sure I've got a few things working. Make sure I've got all this in here. Okay. Make sure I... Oh, good grief, if we get these to roll, I want to be here a week. See this. Come back to my dressing room after the show. I'll do it for you, of course. Okay, okay boys. I think I'm ready. Well, 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 well. Uh, uh, uh. Well, bless my soul. What's wrong with me? I'm itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. My friends say I'm acting a wild as a buck. I'm in love. I'm all shook up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, it's scary. 
a song for you now that's kind of a special little song to me. A lot of folks that follow my career know that I write a lot of sad songs, and this one is absolutely pitiful. It's true. It's a story about a little girl and a puppy dog. And I call it Me and the Landy. you down, I ain't gonna let you up yet. I'm gonna do another song for you that is a song that I wrote when I was about 18 years old and when I first started recording, they wouldn't let me record this on the radio because they said it was too controversial at the time. It was just a story about a girl having a baby. Not nothing that really unnatural about that, do you think? She thought somebody loved her. He left her in trouble and went away and never came back, but that seemed to be too heavy at the time. And so I only put it out in an album. It's something I always like to sing, and I do get quite a bit of requests for it from the album, so I hope you folks will enjoy it tonight. I call it Down from Dover. I know the stress I'm wearing doesn't hide the secret I have tried concealing. Left. 
too And shaking me up so That all I really need Is you come again And here I go
wanted to scare you to death. I do want to again say thanks to all of you for being such a wonderful and sweet audience. Somebody told me once early in my career, best thing to do to perform and to please an audience and when you know you've done the best you can is to make them laugh, make them cry, scare the hell out of them and go home. <laughs> I don't know how much of that we've accomplished tonight, but I'm sure that it is late and I'm sure you folks do want to go home as we all need to, but thank you. But anyway, I want to again say thank you for being a part of my dreams because it is a long ways from the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains to what they call the top of the world. I want to thank you for letting me see my little girl dreams come true because it was always my great desire to travel around and be a so-called star, make a lot of people happy, make myself happy. And I just want you to know I love you for it. And I'll be looking forward to the next time that I get a chance to come back and be with you folks. And I want to uh, dedicate this particular song especially to all of you. If I should stay, well, I would only be in your way. And so I... Yeah. 